Welcome back to the show that tells you, you are a quantum computer with free will accessing platonic forms through the space-time geometry of your wave function mind. My name is Justin Riddle, and this is episode 12 of the Quantum Consciousness series. In today's episode, we will be wrapping up our discussion of epistemology by talking about a theory of everything and what that might look like. By the end of today's episode, we'll be asking the question, is God a geometric shape? How do we reconcile the chaos in the world around us with the crystalline perfection of geometry? If you like what you hear today, then please like this video, subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, or write a review. Join me inside the mystery of numbers. Come and huff a metaphysical so in a previous episode, very early on, I introduced Roger Penrose's three world model. And I really find this model compelling. It is composed of three parts, the physical world, our bodies, the mental world, our minds, our thoughts, our feelings, and the platonic world, which is forms, meaning, understanding, mathematics, things that go beyond any one individual and sort of have a universality you know, flavor to them. And so as we've been talking about epistemology or how do we know what we know, how do we come to understand things, it's been really interesting to go through these different worlds and what knowledge or, or theories or systems of meaning would look like in each of these different worlds. So in the physical world, we talked about deduction and first order logic and this very grounded, true, false framing of the world around us. In the mental world, we talked about inference, um, talking about Bayesian inference and how through experience we can acquire and gather information and build theories of meaning. And so today I want to really dive into the platonic world and what it means to have a theory that is explanatory, that means something. Is there one truth out there? And we are trying to get closer and closer to what that truth is. And I think at face value, there's a lot of evidence for a universal meaning, for some truth that we can move closer and closer to. We can shape our actions to be in alignment with that truth, with those values. And then science is really based on a foundation of seeking a single universal truth and this sense of what's right and what is wrong, and trying to get a model that is as predictive of the universe around us as possible. And so in today's episode, we'll be talking about, you know, what would that theory of everything look like? You know, a theory that could explain all phenomena. What would that entail? What would you need to make something like that? And then the opposition to even having a universal meaning does exist. So we'll kind of talk about this debate between chaos and universality um, and how to kind of reconcile these, these motifs. But I think at a deeper level, there is a sense that we can come into knowledge and come into these universal senses of meaning or, or, or communicable ideas that are meaningful. And what really is the foundation for that? So I'm going to start off by discussing a particular uh, theory of everything proposed by Roger Penrose in his book, The Large, the Small, and the Human Mind. And this will probably be the most, uh, I guess, direct theory related discussion in today's episode. But essentially, he breaks it down that there are all these different theories in physics and they each have predictive power and they each explain certain physical phenomena in our environment. 
And interestingly, there's been a struggle to unify these different forces in physics and to unify these different frameworks of modeling the world around us. And so he presents this really nice figure that sort of maps the basic assumption of Galilean physics, which is the idea that there's sort of this you know, geometric grid that things are operating on and there's sort of a, a basic sense of, of logical consistency within the world and then understanding different phenomena in the world around us and putting the pieces together. And so he breaks it down into thinking about three different constants. The first constant is the speed of light. And I kind of putting this in the physical world because the speed of light defines the fastest that information, digital information, can travel in the world around us. Then he has Planck's constant, and Planck's constant defines the smallest unit when you're quantizing a system. And so in quantum mechanics, you have Planck's constant describing these fundamental units or these quantizations of photons, of electrons, of, of things in our universe. And so I put Planck's constant in the mental world because it relates directly to sort of the, the definition of entities or these holistic systems directly related to the emergence of wave functions um, fitting within the framing within this series of the mental world. And then finally, there is gravity and the gravitational force. And this one is maybe the most anomalous of, of the bunch, but gravity I'm putting in the platonic realm, and these are somewhat loose labels, but in the platonic realm because it's sort of a permeating non-local force, similar to how we've been talking about forms and, uh, and things like hidden variables in, in the platonic level. And so part of the challenge of building a theory of everything in a very practical sense from the, the lens of physics is that we're trying to reconcile these different constants and fit them into a single framework that can handle all of this complexity. And so right now there seems to be a fundamental challenge trying to reconcile the field of general relativity with the domain of quantum mechanics. And so gravity and quantum mechanics seem to be at odds with each other. And briefly, the, the general idea is that we're either thinking of the universe as made up of these quantum systems interacting with each other, or we're viewing it as this sort of space-time grid out there. And that tends to feel more like describing the physical universe as opposed to a bunch of systems interacting. And so the challenge is you need to either gravitize quantum mechanics or quantize gravity. And this has yet to be um, effectively done in the field of physics. And Roger Penrose, his attempt, which I've somewhat covered, is this idea that as a quantum system goes into a superposition, the superposition itself has a gravitational pull between these different um, superposed realities. So if I have one space-time geometric reality over here and another one over here, there's some sort of gravitational interaction within a single quantum system. And this is his attempt to sort of seek a theory of everything by adding gravity into quantum mechanics. And I'm not a physicist, so I don't really know or understand all the details here. But we'll be talking about how we come into having this knowledge in the very first place. So if you want to learn more about gravitizing quantum mechanics or quantizing gravity, I would recommend doing further research uh, for yourself. So how do people come to understand information and how do they come to form these theories of knowledge. And so while I just told you that I'm not a physicist, I don't understand all the details um, required to really flesh out all this information, and I've told you in the past, uh, in previous episodes, 
that I'm really an enthusiast, a fan of all these theories, and I encourage you to look up more um, on your own and to do your own independent research, and I'm not gonna you know, be able to spell out all the details of every theory. However, I will encourage you to think critically and to do your own research with the knowledge that you have the capacity to understand anything that any other human understands. So what do I mean by this? What I mean is that we oftentimes have authority complexes where we say, oh, there's a scientist out there. They understand the secrets of the universe. I am a lowly person, you know, it, walking around the world. And I don't have this hidden, forbidden, secret knowledge of the scientist out there. Or there's a medical doctor that has intricate, infinite knowledge of the human body, and I could not possibly grasp that level of understanding. And I think this is a very common misperception out there, is assigning sort of scientific authority, and then in a weird self-deprecating way, not allowing yourself to go pursue this information and this knowledge. And this is so ubiquitous in our culture, but also ubiquitous throughout time. And Plato addresses this in Mino, and he talks about a, um, a servant in, in someone's home and essentially goes and is chatting. And the reason they're talking about a servant is that they don't have any formal scientific understanding. So I think the equivalent here would be to say someone who hasn't gone to university and maybe doesn't have a high school education. Um, so just sort of a normal person that you would meet um, out in the world. And they walk through this simple geometric puzzle, right? And the puzzle is I have a square. How do I cut the square so that I can get another square that's half the size. And so you can imagine you have a piece of cake and it's a square cake and you wanna cut the cake so that you can remove half of the cake and have exactly half left over. And it's a bit of a puzzle and you'd probably have to sit there thinking about it. But what they do is they already know the solution and they're chatting with this uh, person and they basically get the person to come to the solution to this puzzle. And if you're wondering out there, the solution is if you find halfway along the cake on all sides and you cut um, directly across between the halfway point on each side, that center square that remains is half the size of the original square. And I'll put a little graphic here so you can sort of visually see that that's the case. And so what's the point of this? The point of this is that there is no magical hidden knowledge there that, that you cannot access. You have the capacity to understand anything in science, in medicine, and really all it takes is finding the appropriate resources and then devoting a lot of time and energy and passion to learning more about a certain topic. And so when you meet someone who you look up to as an authority figure, right, maybe they are a professor or some wise person, you can chat with them and they should be able to convey to you all of the hidden mysteries of, of their field or of, of what they know. Uh, they might be hesitant to share this information with you. They might feel a sense of protection over looking weak or looking stupid, and so they want to not give away all the secrets. Um, but you can always break something down into very simple, simple terms, using diagrams, draw it out on a whiteboard, talk for a long time, and with enough time spent communicating, you can understand what that field is all about. Right, So the theory of relativity, the theory of quantum mechanics, these seem outside of the normal person's grasp, 
But if you had an effective teacher, someone devoted to sharing this information with you, you could acquire all of the understanding and the information that you require. And so what does it come down to? And I think that there is this idea that we, we see the, the professor in the tweed coat um, scribbling at a chalkboard and the chalkboard is full of equations. There's like 300 equations and differential equations and integrals and summations and all these complex symbols on the board, right? And then voila, they come to some fancy answer and, and they solve the mystery of the universe. And so we have this idea that, that there, this is like this almost pseudo magical process um, going on. But what it really comes down to, I think, in the real world is simple forms of visualization. And I think an interesting example to this is math prodigies. And so when you have a math prodigy, they'll report, you know, being able to say pi to a thousand digits, or they'll be able to take very large numbers and find the square root of that number or take two really large numbers and multiply them together and just start reading out for you, you know, to arbitrary complexity, hundreds of digits, right? And so in our head, we must think, wow, they're doing all this calculation at this rapid speed. How are they doing this? When you talk to them, what they're doing is they see these geometric shapes in their mind and they create a shape for number one and a shape for the second number, so number A and number B. And they take these numbers, which are these shapes, and they start like morphing them or convolving them into each other. And wherever the points intersect, they can read out a digit. And so they're taking these multi-dimensional geometries and just sort of warping them into each other. And then they're reading out the digits. And I don't know, you know, practically what this really looks like, but it's teachable and it's not magical. And you could imagine these shapes in your own mind and start calculating square roots of 30 digit numbers, right? We have to create a system to teach people how to do this, uh, but, it, but it seems fundamentally teachable. And who knows, maybe in the future, math will be much more geometric and will have these geometric solutions or these geometric ways of viewing things that we can then solve equations uh, more, more quickly or more readily. And I think a good example of this is called the amplituhedron. And the amplituhedron is really fascinating because when you're solving the interaction of different particles in physics, there are systems of equations that govern those interactions. And so when you're calculating this interaction, you have to take these equations into account. You're looking at this equation, applying this next one. And so for certain particle interactions, it will take pages upon pages upon pages of running these calculations to figure out what this interaction is going to look like. And so what's fascinating is that this amplituhedron is a multidimensional geometric shape thought up by a physicist. And then once this geometric shape was conceived of, they could then rewrite these equations such that the calculation was much more effectively computed. And so instead of having many, many, many pages, you have a reduced uh, set of steps that you have to go through to calculate this interaction. So what's interesting here is that both of them are correct, right? Those simpler equations that were longer to compute were accurate. This amplituhedron is also accurate. But what are you screaming at the screen now as the viewer? You're screaming, the amplituhedron is closer to truth, right? Because it's simpler. And this is like a, a principle of Occam's razor where the simpler explanation seems to be more accurate, right? And so at the core of physics, there appears to be this elegance, this beauty, this geometric simplicity. 
and we can find more optimal solutions than we're currently using. And so it's not that we're deleting the math. We're not removing the accuracy of previous math, but there's probably more elegant solutions using novel conceptions that people have not thought up yet today. And this should remind you of Moore's Law, which we talked about in the digital computer episode, where computers are advancing and getting better through human ingenuity. We come up with new ideas of how to make computers, and we do it every couple years, and we keep progressing. Similarly, in physics, we're coming up with novel solutions that are more elegant and tap into some more fundamental geometry. And so now I want to pivot over to Roger Penrose talking about Gödel's incompleteness theorem and how through first order logic and through these much more simple reduced systems of logic, we fail to describe complex systems of mathematics. And so Roger Penrose draws the conclusion that humans are not using a knowably sound algorithm for ascertaining mathematical truth. Essentially, digital computers will not be able to grasp these forms of understanding that we're talking about. So what is it that gives our minds this capacity for understanding? And what Roger Penrose argues is that he calls this non-computation, which is really just a negation of computation. So it's not super compelling as, as, a, as a phrase, but he thinks the secret lies in visualization and in geometry. Humans have a capacity to visualize answers and to solve simple mathematical principles using visualization techniques. And this gives us an edge over digital computers. Digital computers do not have the capacity to visualize, but very naturally humans visualize and solve um, axioms. We can, we can sort of derive mathematical truth through systems of visualization. What do I mean? A times B equals B times A. So if I have A rows of B items, and B rows of A numbers of items, right? So you can imagine if I have a three by four grid and a four by three grid, we know that those are the same. How do we know? Well, we take the grid and we rotate it, right? So we have a four by three and a three by four. I perform this visual transformation in my mind. And now I know that for all A and B, uh, a times B is the same as B times A. And you're convinced and I'm convinced and we visualized it and the proof is in that visualization. Furthermore, Roger Penrose extends this and says that there are geometric puzzles that humans are able to compute the answer to and digital computers find these geometric puzzles non-computable. Digital computers are unable to compute an answer Whereas humans can solve these by kind of playing around visually with these different elements, putting them in different patterns, and we can sort of solve these geometric puzzles, whereas digital computers are not able to find a solution. So all this discussion of visualization and platonic forms, how do we then relate our personal mental experience to these geometries, to these geometric forms? So if we look at the three world model, we talk about this third platonic world. This is the world of forms, of geometry, of mathematics, of understanding. It goes beyond any single individual person. However, there is a connection between the platonic world to the mental world by which humans are able to access the platonic world. And so Roger Penrose speculates, and this is very much a speculation and some early ideas of how this might happen, but Roger Penrose argues that when we undergo moments of understanding or theories and we come in contact with this, um, this form, 
our minds are resonating with and accessing the platonic world. And how are we able to do that? He makes the argument that the space-time geometry within a superposition is able to resonate with these universalities and tap in to this platonic realm. And so the idea here is that as a quantum system or a quantum computer is undergoing a superposition, there's a very specific geometric structure associated with this superposition versus this other one. And that when the superposition collapses into a particular arrangement, that arrangement is describable via geometry and the geometric shape of that space-time reality is then accessing these platonic forms and somehow resonating with them or tapping into them. And so when we view the human mind as a quantum computer, every time you collapse the wave function or you go into a superposition of these conflicting space-time geometries, the geometry itself is meaningful by virtue of the universality of that geometry. So there's a perfect square, there's a perfect triangle, and all of these higher order thoughts and ideas are somehow geometrically describable and that the superposition is then occupying space-time geometries that resonate with these universal forms. And in the, the next couple episodes, we'll go into what it is biologically that might be sustaining these quantum computers and might be tapping into specific geometric arrangements, but more on that in the future. Right now, I wanna dive into this question, is God geometric? And th this is a, a bit of a, a bit of a bait of a question, but is geometry meaningful? And so we talked about how there's this, this relativity and this chaos inherent to digital framings and digital computation, where you say, I have bits of information, but they're entirely arbitrary. I can assign any semantic meaning to the syntax of this sequence of zeros and ones. There is a mapping from syntax into semantics, but there's no reason or there's no rhyme or reason for why it has to be one particular mapping or the other. The syntax itself does not have inherent meaning. And so there's this, this chaos, this arbitrariness within the physical world, within the digitization world, and then there's this geometric level in the platonic world where there's only one square, there's only one triangle, everyone is tapping into the same square or the same triangle. However, is geometry sufficient to describe the complexity of our reality? And I think this is where I think there's a lot of unanswered questions. I'm not fully convinced by this idea of Geometry is better than arbitrariness, right? We can have arbitrary chaos that we, we build structures out of, or we could have crystalline perfect geometry that we then compose structures out of. And I, I don't really see how a sense of love or a sense of purpose or a feeling can really come out of these. So I, I think we're definitely not quite there and there's a lot missing in describing um, the human condition and the human experience through geometry or through arbitrariness. However, I think an interesting point here is that this does tap into sort of a, a sense of value. And where this happens is that you have people that truly believe in the one true meaning. And then you have people that believe we create our own meaning. And I would argue to you that this is really a paradox. People that believe in one meaning are defining the concept of truth relative 
to the lack of meaning or to chaos or to arbitrariness. And people that believe in an arbitrary, um, chaotic, no true meaning define it as the the opposition to, to truth. So there's sort of a counter-dependence or a paradoxical necessity of these two different opposing views of how you know the world is constructed. And so I think that paradox is important to, to grok, for us to appreciate that paradox. And I would probably say to you that the platonic world has this universality, this truth, this meaning. The physical world has this chaos, this arbitrariness, this constructed biological history. And then we're in this mental world, sort of grappling, accessing platonic truths, working within the physical body and the physical apparatus that has evolved over time. And we're sort of the bridge through the paradox. And that's why, you know, this world is pretty bewildering to, to experience. All right, so that is some food for thought for you out there. I hope you enjoyed all of these wacky ideas today. And in the next few episodes, we will be talking about the orchestrated objective reduction model of consciousness, uh, which is the Penrose Hammeroff model. And I'll be diving into the biology proposed in that model. Um, not 100% endorsing it, but I do think it's a compelling and interesting model. And I look forward to talking to you about that very, very soon.